Some claim that an even stronger argument for symbolic understanding is, is found in his De Doctrina Christiana. And we'll cover that briefly. We'll cover what Augustine says here. If a word is prescriptive, forbidding a thing to be disgraceful or evil, or ordering some good thing, it is not to be understood figuratively. If, however, it, appear, it appears to order something which is disgraceful or evil, or to forbid something which is good, then the language is figurative. The Lord says, unless you eat the flesh of the Son of Man and drink his blood, you will not have life in you. This appears to order us to do something disgraceful or evil. Therefore, it is a figure. Figura ergo est, Augustine tells us, commanding us to communicate in the passion of the Lord and to remember pleasantly and usefully that his flesh was crucified and wounded for us. Another example can be found in his commentary on Psalm 3 in which he speaks of the banquet in which the Lord entrusted and handed over to his disciples the symbol of his body and blood. But as O'Connor tells us in a very important commentary, Augustine does not use the word sacrament in a manner identical with that of later theology. For him, it was equivalent of the phrase sacred sign or figure and referred to the visible element in a holy action or activity or gesture. Thus he writes... Signs that pertain to divine things are called sacraments, Augustine says. Augustine further says, the signs of divine things are visible, but what we honor in them are realities that are invisible. He says, they are called sacraments because in them one thing is seen and another understood. That which is seen has a bodily appearance. Spicium habet corpor- corporalem. That which is understood has spiritual fruit. As O'Connor further tells us, one remembers his famous dictum, the word comes to the element and it becomes sacrament. As, so, as O'Connor so eloquently puts it, indeed for Augustine, the word sacrament has much wider meaning than our notion, since it could be applied to many holy rites or gestures that were not sacraments in our sense of the seven. Thus, in the passage cited above from his letter to Januarius, January, excuse me, he calls the Feast of Pentecost a sacramentum, i.e. a visible sign of something sacred. From this visible element, Augustine always distinguished what he called the reality, the res, and the power, the virtus, of the sacrament. Nevertheless, for him, this reality and power were not something that, in the Christian dispensation, existed apart from the sacramental sign. As one can see by reading his commentary on John 6, Augustine held that both Jews and Christians both had sacraments. As O'Connor, who specializes in the patristic texts, tells us, if one examines the text cited above, which apparently support a merely symbolic understanding of the Eucharist, one can see the different perspective obtained by bearing in mind his notion of the word sacrament. The sacraments, i.e. the visible elements, bear a certain similarity to those things of which they are sacraments. Since Christ himself is our heavenly food, the sign or sacrament of his body and blood is itself in a certain way Christ, i.e. since they are food and he is food. So too baptism. The visible elements, the sacrament, bear a certain resemblance to faith, which cleanses from sin and makes us belong to God. This understanding illuminates, too, his words from the De Doctrina Christiana and his commentary in Psalm 3. When the Lord spoke of eating his flesh and drinking his blood, he was not encouraging cannibalism, which was, as he says, something disgraceful or evil. The eating, in the actual physical sense of that word, referred to the figure or symbol or sacrament that bears a similarity in the he- to the heavenly food. The body and blood of Christ himself, which are the reality, the rest, eaten, but are also the food that eating does not diminish. Now that we've covered these, we will now move on to the clearest explanations that St. Augustine has for us in his expositions on the Lord's precious supper. In his Augustine, in his sermon 222 on Easter Sunday, PL 38, he tells us, I remember my promise. For last night I promised you who have been baptized a sermon in which I would explain the sacrament of the Lord's table, which you now behold and which you became partakers of last night. You should understand what you have received, what you will receive, indeed what you should receive daily. That bread that you see on the altar, that bread that you see on the altar and that has been sanctified by the word of God is the body of Christ. Through these things the Lord Christ wished to entrust to us his body and his blood, which he shed for us unto the remission of sins. If you receive them, well, you are that which you receive, the apostle says. One bread and we the many are one body. 
further, he says, We did not know him in the flesh, yet we have deserved to eat his flesh and to be his members in his flesh. As O'Connor tells us, one of his clearest statements is found in his commentary on Psalm 33, in brackets 34. Excuse me. The inscription states that it is a psalm of David composed by him at the time of the episode recounted in 1 Samuel 21, 10 to 15. Attempting to give this background to his hearers, Augustine came across an exegetical difficulty. His old Latin translation of 1 Samuel 21, 13 was a very poor one. And the verse read, he carried himself in his own hands. Having raised a difficulty, Augustine was left to explain how anyone could carry himself in his own hands. Augustine tells us, and he, in his exposition on the Psalm 33, in his first sermon, and he was carried in his own hands. Now, brothers, who can understand how, how this can happen to a man? Who can be carried in his own hands? A man is able to be carried in the hands of others, but no one is carried in his own hands. How this is to be understood in a literal way of David himself, we cannot discover. However, we can discover how this happened in the case of Christ. For Christ was carried in his own hands. For Christ was carried in his own hands when, entrusting to us his own body, he said, this is my body. Indeed, he was carrying that body in his own hands. As O'Connor shows us, that it was not an offhand or non-reflective remark on his part can be seen from the fact that Augustine returned to the idea the following day when he gave his second sermon on the same psalm. And he carried himself in his own hands. How was he carried in his own hands? Because when he entrusted his own body and blood, he took in his hands that which the faithful are aware of. And he carried himself in a certain way when he said, this is my body. Second sermon on the same psalm. As O'Connor tells us, there are other clear indications of his Eucharistic realism. He tells us, for example, that the Eucharist is to be adored and that Christians would not be communicated at all unless it was the flesh of Christ. Indeed, he repeats the teaching already expressed by St. Ignatius and St. Ambrose. The flesh we receive is the very flesh born of Mary. He took earth from earth because, fle because flesh is from the earth. And he took the... F and he took flesh of the flesh of Mary. He walked on earth in that same flesh and gave that same flesh to us to be eaten for our salvation. Moreover, no one eats that flesh unless he has first adored it. And we sin by not adoring it, he tells us in an, an orations in Psalm 98, 9. In his sermon 130, PL 38, he tells us, Who is the bread of heaven except Christ? But in order that man might eat the bread might eat the bread of angels. The Lord of the angels became a man. If this had not happened, we would not have his flesh. If we did not have his flesh, we would not eat the bread of the altar. In his sermon 5-7, he says, It is indeed a great table where the Lord of the, of the table is himself the food. No one feeds guests upon himself, but the Lord Christ does this. He himself is the one who invites. He himself is the food and drink. In his sermon, 228b, and of course there, there are a number of individuals I want to be clear out, clear from the start, who have disputed the authenticity of this verse here. But nevertheless, O'Connor and uh, a number of other individuals that uh, spe specialize in, in the Augustinian texts uh, claim that it is definitely authentic. I recommend anybody uh, look over his sermon, 228b. In there he tells us, he says, Therefore, take and eat the body of Christ. All of you who have already been made members of Christ in the body of Christ, take and drink the blood of Christ, just as this is changed when, into, just as this is changed into when you eat and drink, so you will be turned into the body of Christ when you live obediently and worthily. The Latin is similar to that of Augustine. There's nothing in this that could lead us to believe that it is not Augustinian. But nevertheless, a copious amount of evidence from Augustine's writings and Augustine's teachings and the fact that Augustine was, ca was taught, was catechized by the great St. Ambrose. <clears throat> we can see that Augustine definitely believed in the change of the elements. Augustine was clear. He said that bread you see on the altar, once it's been sanctified by the word of God, becomes the body and the blood of Christ. It is the body and the blood of our God. Jesus Christ, Augustine, in this aspect, 
as, and as we will see further on in the debate, was thoroughly Catholic. I will now yield the rest of my time, and um, I look forward to listening to Turretin fans' opening. Thank you.